It has now been over a year since The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom released on the Nintendo Switch, and after a long time waiting for this game, it finally was reality, and we could finally jump into Hyrule once again, this time with our brand new Zonai arm. But after a year, I've been really sitting on this game and pondering what I felt about it, exactly how this game made me feel, especially compared to that of the original Breath of the Wild, which to me is one of my favorite video games of all time, easily, like almost no competition, how much I fell in love with that game. But today we're talking about Tears of the Kingdom, and what better time to talk about this game than the one year anniversary. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, this video is gonna lean more on the negative side. Not extremely, I'm not bashing the game or hating on it in any means. In fact, I actually really did enjoy my time with this game and easily put in well over 100 hours, very quickly. But some parts of this game, and dare I say, a a good chunk of this game really didn't sit right with me, and this is a video that I've been wanting to make for a very long time. And I didn't want to rush out and make it as soon as Tears of the Kingdom came out, because I wanted to give it time to marinate and really sit down in front of the camera, well, the mic in this case, and really just talk about every little aspect of this game that I want to go over, and really give my full opinion on it. Something else that I want to point out too before we begin is that this is not another case of the year later, I'm going to hate this game sort of thing that's been going around. I've seen people doing that with Mario Odyssey and even Breath of the Wild when it came out, and I definitely did not agree with that stuff. And I know people do it a lot, and a lot of it is for attention, but this is a certain way that I've been feeling about this game even since the very beginning. I mean, all the way back as the first couple of trailers, and even once the game launched, I still had some feelings in the back of my mind, and I never was fully on board with this being what people call the greatest game of all time. And I'm gonna try to explain to you why I feel like this game missed the mark for me. So what better way to start this video than going all the way back to the beginning where it all started, the first trailer for The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. It's E3 2019, and Nintendo has one more trailer to reveal at the end of the show. And of course, we're amazed to see Link and Zelda walking in some type of underground chasm, of course, looking very similar to that of Breath of the Wild. And before long, we get revealed some type of mysterious figure, and immediately, everybody knows that it's Ganondorf, and the hype is once again regained from 2017's Breath of the Wild. Just two years later, we're already getting a brand new trailer for a sequel to that game, not to mention that we just got DLC the year prior as well well for Breath of the Wild, so this was actually insane. Everybody was losing their minds, and myself included. I could not believe that there was already going to be a sequel to this game. After Breath of the Wild was one of my favorite games of all time, I could only imagine what Nintendo was going to do with the sequel. I mean seriously, the possibilities were endless. With this being the very first open world Zelda game, I really could not wait to see exactly what they did with the world, and how they changed everything from the first game by taking some of the best moments moments and incorporating them in a new way with the sequel. I remember being so excited to see the rest of the trailers to follow, and all that excitement kind of dwindled for me. Every single brand new trailer we would get felt like a little snippet of something Nintendo didn't even want to show us in the first place. I mean, the next couple of trailers were only about 15 to 30 seconds long of actual gameplay, and none of them really did a whole lot to excite me. There was a couple of moments of ooh and ah as Link skydived high into the clouds of Hyrule, and still, even then, I was like, okay, this is pretty cool, but where exactly is he skydiving to? Is he landing on a brand new map? Are these sky islands more expansive and something that covers the entire range of the map, is there something else Nintendo is hiding? And for a while, I had that mindset, that Nintendo had something really big that they were hiding. Something so big, in fact, that they were saving for us to find out and explore on our own. And it turned out that they actually did have something like that, and I'll get into that in a bit, but it never did reach anywhere near what I was expecting for them to do. I know I had some high hopes for this game, 
But man, even my lower hopes seemed as if they weren't being reached. These trailers just weren't really connecting with me on any level. It was just like, oh, here's some more Breath of the Wild DLC looking gameplay that really didn't hype me up whatsoever. Every now and then we got a new enemy reveal and then maybe a small little new location, but for the most part, it looked like we were still going back to that same Hyrule. That same Hyrule that lots of us had spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I remember being very worried about this, and I remember even posting videos about it and a lot of people telling me just calm down, you have to trust the Zelda team. They always know what they're doing, and naturally I agreed. I said clearly there's something that they're hiding from us, and I even made videos about all the things that it actually could be and why they're being so secretive with the game. And that was another thing is that a lot of these trailers hardly even showed anything of interest. In fact, it seemed like they were hiding the entire game and the only thing that they wanted to show us was Link moving and flying around the sky and that was about it. And it seemed like we had to wait extremely long stretches before we saw something else about the game. I mean in fact we were just a couple of months until release and we still had no clue what the heck we were going to be playing. That just didn't sit right with me those last two trailers, especially the last one, really had me scratching my head still, knowing that there was just months until the game came out, and at this time, just about a month, and seeing what I saw, it didn't really impress me. I was holding out and really hoping on a new world, and maybe that was just my expectation at the time, or maybe at least it completely changed Hyrule, or a different version of Hyrule that was a lot different from what we played in Breath of the Wild. But every single clip we saw of Link running through the specific towns that we've seen already, like Hateno Village and even Kakariko Village, they all looked exactly the same with some super small changes. Hateno now had mushrooms, and Kakariko now has some falling debris all over it, but it was the exact same towns, the exact same Hyrule and area that we've already explored, and every single scene seemed to be a one-to-one -one comparison to what we've already played. In fact, YouTubers were actually making videos at the time comparing both Breath of the Wild world and Tears of the Kingdom's world, and it was pretty much one-to-one -one exactly the same, just with a few caves, holes in the ground, or the occasional giant falling glyph that was stuck sticking out of the sand or something. After all, it was the exact same map, and Nintendo had chosen not to change it really at all, or add any significant new location to the map that we once loved and enjoyed. And to me, this is what started to worry me the most. The map started to really scare me, and it was the one thing that really truly made me fall in love with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And that is where some of my problems begin. <laughs> Like I mentioned before, I felt like Breath of the Wild's soul came from its map. The fact that we could explore this gigantic terrain with different types of biomes and areas and towns to explore felt very inviting. It was one of the greatest feelings ever to just encounter a new area that you missed, and even after putting in hundreds and hundreds of hours, there were still people finding easter eggs and secrets around the map years later, and Tears of the Kingdom decided to just use this same map again, and to me, that is a big reason why the charm was kind of sucked out of this game. For any open world game, I feel like the map is probably the most important part of your entire game. It's the place that the character and the player is going to be spending pretty much their entire time in and exploring. Tears of the Kingdom essentially took the same exact Link with a very similar moveset, not the exact same, and slapped him in the same world. And I hate comparisons because it's hard to compare a game like Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild with something else, but what I like to think about is imagine if Super Mario Galaxy 2 had all the same galaxies. It's still the same Mario with maybe a couple new power-ups, but it's in the same exact galaxies and there's now some caves and differences with them, but it's the same. Same thing if there was an Odyssey 2 and they decided to bring back the same exact kingdoms with Mario's same moveset just with some slight changes, or GTA 6 coming out soon had the same map as GTA 5. A lot of people would be very upset to have the same map that they waited so long to play the sequel on. You know, we waited a very long time for Tears of the Kingdom, and as we sat and waited and thought about what they could do with the map, we really, I think a lot of us, myself included, expected maybe even a new map to have Link run around in and explore. Most of the time when we have games with big exciting worlds, 
worlds, the sequel always gives us a new world to explore. For instance, games moving on from Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mask, which actually gave us from Hyrule Field to Termina. Wind Waker to Phantom Hourglass may have kept Link on the Great Sea, but every single island on that Great Sea was different. The sea itself felt different as well. And we can continue on other games, such as the Horizon games, where Aloy would explore two completely different maps. So I feel like having Link primarily stay the same with lots of his moves. Yes, he has a new Zonai arm, but a lot of those moves and abilities are pretty much the same as Sheikah Slate's. And once again, I'll dive into that later. Something else I noticed was one of the biggest new additions was the caves, and this actually was probably the most exciting part and the most exciting changes of the map. I never knew when I was gonna find a brand new cave to take me deep into the map, and it was always kind of cool to go throughout these little mazes on the inside, but at the end of the day, it never led to anything super interesting. There was a couple of small unique locations, but nothing really crazy such as crazy new easter eggs or stuff that add to the story or to the lore, and most of the side quests were going in and taking out an enemy or going in in order to grab some treasure in a hidden chest. So for the most part, caves were just there for a quick off the beaten path look to go see what you could find, whether it be some additional weaponry or armor or, you know, some treasure. The regions themselves try to change, but all those changes were temporary in the story. For instance, the muck-filled Zora's Domain, or the giant sandstorm that blanketed the desert in the Gerudo region, or the snow-covered Rito area, which were all put back to normal shortly after you completed those parts of the story. I actually really enjoyed these changes and it did make the regions feel a little different, but it didn't last long before it was right back to the same way it was in Breath of the Wild. The Goron area, with actually no lava, was pretty cool, and it had lots of cool implications with the minecart system that was implemented thanks to the Yonobo. But even then, it was the same exact area, but lava is gone now, and it's not as red as it was before. And that was probably the biggest change out of any area on the map. And this includes the towns as well. None of the towns really experienced a huge change. Hateno Village was essentially the exact same, with now mushrooms everywhere because of a fashion designer that moved in that loved mushrooms. Yeah, that, that's not enough to really change that location. Well, what about Lurland Village? Well, there's pirates now that are invading and you had to help them rebuild, which could have been really cool if it changed the way the town looked or if we were able to redesign the town the way we wanted it to, but nope, it just rebuilt the town to look exactly the way it does in Breath of the Wild. Or what if we go to Rito Village? Well, that one's exactly the same as well, without a giant divine beast at the top of the lookout. Well, what if we move on to the Gerudo Desert? Once again, exactly the same, and this can be said for every location, even Kakariko Village, which now just has giant pillars and giant debris that had fallen from the sky all over it, which once again doesn't really impact the town whatsoever. It would have been really cool if each of the towns had undergone some type of big change. Like I said previously, if we had to rebuild Lurland Village, and actually could make it custom to how we want it set up. Now, it doesn't have to be anything super crazy, all Animal Crossing style, but just allowing us to kind of place houses in new areas and change the way they look and design what type of houses could be put there would have been really, really cool and just change the area up a little bit. I would have loved to see a completely changed up Hateno village instead of just mushrooms being on certain buildings, maybe some type of destruction hit, or maybe that's exactly how each of the locations are, where they've been destroyed by Ganondorf and his upheaval, and now it's up to us to rebuild these locations and change how they look. Maybe some of these towns fell underground down into the depths and the people of the town had to build themselves in a giant wall to protect themselves from the creatures and beasts that lurked down there. There's a lot that they actually could have done to change the towns up, but once again, it just never felt special to me. Like the first time riding my horse into Hateno Village, or the first time walking over the mountains and seeing Kakariko Village from the top of one of the tallest hills, it was those experiences that I was missing and that I was longing for, and it just felt like, a, oh, a trip back to the same place that I've all already visited and walked all around 
the last seven years. And it wasn't just the towns, it goes for the entirety of the map. Certain places that I was really excited to see how they were going to change with the upheaval of Ganondorf and Tears of the Kingdom were left completely untouched. The Akala Citadel is arguably one of the most important places on the entirety of the map in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It was the last standing point for the army of Hyrule where they were pushed back to the top of this tower in order to fight off Ganon's forces. It was known as the final battle before Zelda intervened and saved the day. And the fact that this very important location could now be even more explored thanks to the fact that there's caves and even the deaths in The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, surely this cave is going to have some cool entrances and secret passageways showing the inside of the citadel for the first time, right? No, it's just a network of empty caves with some ore deposits and of course some horriblins crawling across the ceiling and the occasional chest or two. It's situations like this that left me in complete disarray and confusion as to what Nintendo was doing, because they already flushed out some locations, like for instance you can actually go underneath where Hyrule Castle was and explore some cave networks that takes you underneath the castle in some really cool areas, but then they do absolutely nothing of the sorts for Akala Citadel. when. It's even crazier considering the fact that Age of Calamity actually had a whole mission dedicated to the inside of the Citadel, completely flushing it out, which is weird that they didn't use any of those assets or locations as inspiration for the inside of the Citadel in Tears of the Kingdom. Instead, it's still completely shut off and nothing's in there, which is just confusing to me. And with what seems to be the main theme of cave networks and depths for Tears of the Kingdom, I was really expecting some locations that I felt love with with Breath of the Wild to be further expanded on. For instance, the giant cave with the Leviathan bones I thought maybe would have broken down and allowing us to explore even deeper into the cave. But no, it's exactly the same that we left off. The only thing that we're doing in there is rebuilding the Leviathan bones that broke apart during the upheaval. And the same thing across the entirety of the land, where giant holes or chasms were, nothing changed with those locations. Where they could have had some really unique changes added to the map, they decided not to even bother changing a lot of those places. There were so many times I found myself walking in Tears of the Kingdom or riding my horse or even flying on one of my contraptions that I built and spotting something I remembered from Breath of the Wild in the background and I said oh I want to go visit that because I want to see how it's changed just to see that nope nothing's really changed with this location at all. Some locations were so shocking that I would move around and try to build things and maybe mess with certain parts that weren't meant to be messed with or maybe move a boulder because maybe there's just something that I'm missing. I can't tell you how long I spent on Akala Citadel trying to move things around and find an entrance into the Citadel just to be told that nope, it's just a new enemy camp now for the Horriblins. It was just extremely, and I would even say massively disappointing. Breath of the Wild had so many cool locations, I actually started a series just going around and showcasing some of those locations to everybody and showing them off and how cool it was and some of these secret locations that maybe a lot of people could have missed in their playthrough and some easter eggs and tie-ins to past games. Now Tears of the Kingdom did have a couple, for instance there was a really cool ice cave that reminded me of Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess and some fairy fountains that looked like one of those past games. but. It it was very minor when I did find something like this. I'm talking like a four or five occasions of the entirety of the game that I find something that could have been a callback to a past Zelda game. It's not even confirmed that they were. And there were so many times I was trying to talk myself into believing that something was new and I would go back to Breath of the Wild and be like, nope, that was in that game as well. Or if something was supposed to be changed and it wasn't. For instance, my biggest highlights I think of the world and the changes that were incorporated was every now and then I would find a new little chasm to jump in and explore and it was pretty cool looking but it never exceeded cool looking that's really all it was okay that's a cool cave that's a cool chasm they didn't really do anything with this there's no easter eggs or you know lore secrets or anything important down here at all it's just here because it can be. I also can't believe places like Tenagar Canyon was left unchanged as well, considering the fact that it's a giant canyon that runs through the entire western side of Hyrule is just completely the same. This canyon that could have been broken down and maybe opened wider filled with caves and new areas thanks to the upheaval had been completely untouched the entire 
region. It's just stuff like this that made me think maybe the developers were rushed or this project wasn't completely thought out as much as what the developers wanted it to be. Do you remember the labyrinths from Breath of the Wild, which were the giant mazes on the outside of the entire kingdom? These were some pretty cool secret mazes that you could go in and figure out in order to find a secret treasure and, of course, a shrine at the end of each one. Well, these labyrinths are still here and there's new ones added that are either floating above or deep in the ground below but they ideally work the same it's just more of the same mazes and those same mazes are still there from breath of the wild but without any of the traps or problems that prevented you from reaching them in the first game which means you can go straight to the end of the mazes that are there from breath of the wild and go straight to a new shrine that's in the place of where the old shrine was it's stuff like this that just made me think that they didn't care about certain locations that were left from breath of the wild and they just said i ah, leave it slap another shrine there and they moved on. I remember seeing these and just thinking to myself, they didn't change these at all? Yeah, I know they added more mazes floating above it and down below it, but those were also ideally the same. You're just flying around a maze doing a very simplistic puzzle where all you need to do is look at your map. Now I know the whole point of this was for the three mazes on the three different tiers, the depths, the normal ground, and the sky islands were supposed to interact with each other, where you know you would complete one shrine and it would open the gate to the top one or to the bottom one and you're supposed to interact with all of them, maybe going all the way up from the underground straight to the top or skydiving from the top going all the way through the mazes down to the bottom one, and I get that that, but they could have at least changed the ones from Breath of the Wild a little bit, right? Another thing that made the map kind of weird to me is that all the treasure that you would find was a lot of costumes that were already in the first game. Like, 90% of the outfits are the same exact outfits that you already found in Breath of the Wild, but now you have to go find them again deep in the depths or high in the Sky Islands. I, I don't understand why that was the case. I can't sit here and act like I didn't have any fun whatsoever with the overworld. There were still some locations that were fun to explore and enemy camps to tackle, but overall I was still expecting a little bit more more, but let's take on the other parts of the map, including the underground and the skies above. But first, let's dive on down to the depths. <laughs> I remember it was the weekend before the launch week for Tears of the Kingdom and how unbelievably impatient I was because I just had to see what was going on with this game. Was there anything new added? Was there something that we just weren't being shown? Well, the game had been leaked incredibly early and lots of people were playing online, including on TikTok Live. And I actually came across a couple of videos and I came across one specific one that showed someone running through the depths and immediately I felt a sensation of excitement. Some Something that I have not felt in any other trailer that showcased this game. I was so excited to see that there was apparently another world down below. And not only that, it was the same size of the overall map. It was that massive and I saw glimpses and images of the map and I got so unbelievably excited and I kept myself from seeing any other leaks because now I finally had the hype that I needed. I saw that there was something in this game to give me purpose, to give me excitement, and I was fine. The game came out and I jumped down into the depths the first time and was amazed by how creepy and amazingly deep it was down below ground and how the transition was so seamless going from the ground all the way down below ground. It was the coolest thing ever, at least at first, for about a couple hours honestly. So once I got down there, I was immediately wondering what crazy things could be lurking down here for me to find. Any crazy easter eggs or secrets to the lore, missions having me come down here in order to find some type of creepy, locked up, caged beast that's been down here for generations. And no, I mean, there was really none of that. No secret locations hiding any story lore or anything super exciting outside of a couple treasure chests. When I would find something that looked like a creepy gigantic enemy, it was just a boss that I've already fought in the story mode that's just down here now. It was cool that we could rebattle them down here, but it kind of took away from how amazingly exciting it would have been to see a creature like this that wasn't tied to an overworld boss. I found myself spending hours and hours just taking my hover bike across the chasms and the giant mountain ranges down below and just flying aimlessly in the dark until I found light roads. And yes, I got every single one and I can tell you it was definitely not worth it. It's cool to see the whole map flushed out, 
but there's nothing down there. I mean, it's so dark, in fact, you really can't see where you're going, so you're just finding the nearest light route, and once you light it in the surrounding area, nothing nearby is any interesting at all either. It's just more mountains, more giant walls and caverns that block your access to going any further, and that's about it. You'll come across tons and tons of these same exact looking enemy camps with these same enemies that you'll find in the above world, where this time they're covered in gloom, making them a lot stronger and taking away hearts permanently from you until you get back into the light, but besides that, why do I need to fight them? Yes, I know there's stronger weapons down here, but even those weapons aren't needed to complete this game. In fact, I went through the entirety of the game without getting a single weapon down here and didn't miss it at all. There are little outposts where you can build contraptions, but it's also one of those things like why do I even need to when I can create a hover bike or I can create something a lot easier than the tools that they give me because a lot of the time it's just a glider with some fans where you can kind of fly straight ahead of you and it just doesn't really make sense as to why I need to build something like this. And of course this is where I can go a lot deeper within the actual building mechanics to this game but why do I need cannons on a giant glider? I mean there's nothing really to shoot down here. There's no giant monsters or even Hinoxes walking down here so it kind of just defeats the purpose to have some type of weaponry built for what? It's just a giant empty space down here. At this point of the game is when I start to realize that Nintendo just didn't have any new original ideas when it came to world building and it kind of frustrated me because mentally I was sitting there thinking of how many different ways that they could have expanded on some of the areas of the map. The depths is probably the coolest idea that Nintendo could have came up with for the idea of a second map and the fact that it went completely underutilized felt so unbelievably disappointing pointing to me. I would have loved to see a whole civilization down here, or maybe some Zonai continue to live down here in the depths after all these years, or some type of new group moved in down here. Maybe you'd want to go down to the depths in order to fight new types of enemies to get new types of horns and weaponry, but there's no new enemies down here. The only new enemy that you will come across is the frogs, and the baby froxes, which is just like these little frog creatures, and the babies are literally nothing. I mean, you can literally take them out with a single sword swipe, and the giant froxes are extremely easy to take down as well. If you just bullet time an arrow to their eye, they're never gonna get off the ground. And of course, that's also for later on where we talk about more of the combat. But I wanna focus more on the depths itself, where like I said, it was just lacking variety. No new enemies, no new characters or civilizations or underground towns, and nothing really worthwhile to go and explore. Just to give some slight examples of some of the locations down there, you have the Gerudo Underground Cemetery. And I really thought this place would have been a lot cooler and and had some type of cool thing going on with it. Maybe you could get into one of the coffins and it led you to some underground chamber or something like that, similar to Arbiter's Grounds. But nope, it's just full of Gibdos who move at you at the pace of a snail, and it doesn't really offer anything of exploration. Yes, there's some pose here, which is also my other problem, that the pose have now been simplified to be pretty much just an underground currency in order to get equipment, such as new clothes and gear to help you with the depths. And this just kind of disappointed me. I would have loved if this area was full of pose, like actual pose from Ocarina of Time that would just haunt the area. That would have been really cool to come up on a completely brand new enemy archetype only specific for this location could have tied it into a really cool story side quest. To me, one of the coolest things in the entirety of the depths was a giant Poe statue called the Cliff Bargainer statue, and the only reason it's there is for you to go up to it and bargain for some gear with your Poe's that you've collected, which there are multiple of these all around the map. I really wish they would have done something super cool with this statue. Could you imagine if you approached it and it started to wake up and move and you actually had to defeat it all Shadow of the Colossus style by climbing it and scaling the top of its head? Head, that would have been amazing to see this giant creature walking in the dark shadows of the depths and really encouraged me to explore more areas and do more stuff like this. Also would have loved if maybe the areas underneath certain towns had some type of unique town of its own underground, but instead they're just mines, lots and lots of mines, where a majority of them look exactly the same, and there's pretty much just battle arenas where you'll fight Master Koga. Even the unique mines don't really have anything to offer, but just a slew of enemies and ore deposits for you to break down. That's not to say that there was nothing cool down there, because the thing is, there were some cool spots like the Secret Spring of Revival, but there was just nothing tied into it. Like, there was no side quests, there was no cool easter eggs that could have tied into some story stuff, it was just like, oh, here's this really cool cool spring that can heal you. 
there's nothing else to it. And that to me just felt like lazy map design. Or the underground fortress, which was exactly that, a giant fortress that instead of going high up into the mountains, it went really down into a cavern, and it was really cool to kind of explore the area and see all the enemies lining the walls, but I wish there was some type of substance to it. There was really no reason to explore it. There was nothing secret or nothing really cool. I mean, there were some things that you could stretch, like maybe a broken house that was full of a family of Poes and what looked like to be maybe a mother or father Poe, but like I said, I, that's extremely stretching on my part, and clearly I have to give the area more soul than it already had. We're finding the Gerudo Dark Skeleton down below the ground, and I believe there were three Dark Skeletons that you could find underground, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I couldn't 100% remember if there was a side quest tied to these skeletons. It could have been another one of just taking pictures of them, but I don't even remember it. If there was a side quest, it was an extremely small one. I guess I was just looking for more crazy things to happen in the caves and in the depths to better interact with the world, and I wasn't expecting anything super insane, but just something to make me say, I want to explore the rest of this map. I mean, I did go through every square inch of the depths just to look for anything that could be relatively interesting. And after my long journey, I can't really say that there was anything that really made me say I had to call my friend up to go explore this area of the depths. Just nothing really caught my attention like that. As far as things that you could actually do in the depths that kind of matter, you would come across an occasional Yiga clan hideout, and it was cool to see the Yiga in their own constructions kind of driving around the areas and scoping it out. And you could either go in like in a sneaky route and take them out with your arrow and pick them off one by one, you could just run in guns a blazing and just wreak havoc on everybody, which I actually found these areas to be kind of cool. Once again, I still wish more came from them and there was more reason to go to each one, but I still had fun finding each one and jumping in there in order to get the treasure that lied behind the doors. And another reason why the depths is so weird to me is, is it was this huge map that was supposed to be used and I feel like the story didn't even touch over 90% of it. And you drop down there for only two story beats and that's about it. And only one of those I thought was a pretty cool entrance when you jumped into the mouth of the volcano in order to fly down through the crater and it just took you straight underground. I feel like this was one of the best uses for the depths of the entire game and it was just to go down to one of the multiple dungeons in this game. Outside of diving down to the fire temple, my second favorite use usage of the depths was a side quest. Once again, not even a main thing that you had to do, and a lot of people could have missed it, that dealt with the Great Plateau, which actually had you looking for eyeball statues, dropping them down these holes, and flying down to grab them, while also putting them in a minecart and taking them to a giant Poe statue in order to rebuild him. This was actually really, really cool, how it kind of connected the above ground and the depths together, and I loved this mission, and I cannot believe there's really no other other missions in the entire game that does something like this. Another thing I know a lot of people are going to bring up and say that isn't it really cool that the dragons could go underground? And yes, it's actually phenomenal. I thought it was just one of the coolest things when I found it by accident and I was like, is that dragon really flying into the depths? And jumping down there and seeing it fly around was really breathtaking and one of my favorite moments of the entire game. But once again, I wish they did more with this. Why do the dragons go into the depths? What reason do they have to be flying down there? I mean, clearly they didn't do it before. I know the depths weren't open in Breath of the Wild, but why are they down here? What's the purpose? Do they do anything else? It's the same exact thing as before, where you collect pieces of the dragon by slicing them and then just flying away. But the actual aesthetic of just flying down there with the dragons, yeah, it's pretty cool, and even I can't deny that. Something I was really hoping they would have done if they were going to just go with this second map underground, if they changed it to some type of dark world or something along those lines. I think the dark world in The Legend of Zelda a link to the past is one of the coolest things in gaming. I was so mesmerized by the idea as a kid of this alternate dimension, this second world that's like a mirrored version, a different version of the top world where some things look the same, but a lot of the locations are changed and look different. I really wish they would have done something like that. And you could have had a new race of people down there, you know, the opposites of the characters we have above ground. And having something like this in an open world would have been phenomenal, giving us tons of new areas to explore, new locations, new regions, and how they could have worked with the top world and the bottom world together. And they did this in a link between worlds with low rule compared to high rule. And this little mirrored type of world is something that I thought would have worked perfectly with Tears of the Kingdom. How do you make a second world? How do you make a sequel to Breath of the Wild 
this is how. You have a second world that is vastly different, that has connections and similarities to the top world, but does stuff in different ways. And it feels like almost like Nintendo just didn't have time to do something like this. And if that's the case, maybe they shouldn't have rushed this out. Now look, the depths are probably not meant to be explored 100% the way I did. And if that's the case, sure whatever but at the same time if your overworld is the same very minor changes and your below ground brand new map the same size of the overworld is just essentially very empty then what new areas and terrain do you have for players to explore well that leaves us with one more area and that is the skylands <laughs> The Skylands were one of the first things that were advertised for this Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom game. It was telling us that essentially we would be taking our adventures up into the sky, and this was actually kind of interesting. It reminded me of one of my favorite Zelda games of all time, Skyward Sword, being able to fly around all these different islands that interconnect with one another, and I thought there could have been some crazy potential for this. In fact, I even thought it was a good idea to maybe even tie in some Skyward Sword lore to the overall story of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Spend about the first couple of hours or so kind of exploring this giant sky island where the Temple of Time rests, where you need to gather some abilities for your hand, and eventually you can drop down to the ground below. This giant sky island works like the Great Plateau, a giant area for you to explore and find enemies to defeat, collect some things, and learn the basics of the game. And in fact, this was actually awesome. I had a blast running through this area and everything was completely new, including the enemy designs and even weapons and terrain. It was a fun area to explore, find some goodies, and even complete some shrine quests, and I really don't have much to complain about here. It serves this purpose being exactly what it needs to be, a training ground for Link. But after you jump down from this area, it's just like diving into Breath of the Wild again as you land into a very familiar map. In fact, you don't really need to come back up into the sky for much of anything. There's nothing up there besides shrines, a couple of treasure chests, and some dungeon quests that require you to go a little bit higher. But for the most part, I I thought the Sky Islands were going to be more expansive. I thought there were going to be more of them and a lot bigger like the opening area in the game, allowing us to explore some unique regions. You find tons of little islands spread across the entirety of the sky, but 90% of them are the exact same, where they're little battle arenas where you'll fight a Flux Construct or maybe even a Gleok slash King Gleok. But after your first couple, it just gets very repetitive, especially since some of the islands require you to fly a very long distance. I'm talking some of them took upwards to 8 to 10 minutes just to reach, just to find another Flux or Gleok fight that you've already accomplished multiple, multiple times. Every now and then I would come across a giant pillar of floating blocks that stretch high, and I mean extremely high into the sky, just to get to the very top, just to find a treasure chest that would probably home a sage's will. And then, if not that, it would just be, oh, this is a really cool high part of the map with nothing up here. And even the situations where there was something, it was just a simple skydiving challenge where you would have to jump from the top and go through some hoops to reach the bottom where there would be water down below. And that was about it. Most of the time climbing some of these tall structures was just for the sightseeing, and that's really all I can say it offered. And like I just said, the best part of the Sky Islands I felt like were the lead-ups to some of the dungeons, and I don't want to dive into these right now because I want to focus on the dungeon talk when I talk about these, but they were some of the highlights of my playthrough. Once again, look, maybe it's just I'm looking for too much, but I feel like I'm not for a $70 price tagged sequel to one of the best Zelda games, one of the best Nintendo games, and arguably one of the best video games of all time, I really expected more from the map design, whether it be in the skies, down below in the depths, or in the overworld. I really wish they would have just gave us a second map to explore, or at least a new map altogether. And would it have been too much to ask for just to have a couple more islands that were a lot bigger and gave us a reason to go up into the sky? I mean seriously, I didn't want to go up there from time to time because I knew the only thing I'd be getting is a Sage's Will, which would slightly improve some of my champion abilities. But besides that, I really would have loved to just had a cameo to Skyward Sword if there was just like a little island that looked like it. Remember going to Evan Tide Island from Breath of the Wild, it was a whole callback to Link's Awakening, and it was an amazing journey and something that was one of the coolest little easter eggs I think I've ever witnessed in a Zelda game ever. 
And there was nothing like this, no type of moment whatsoever that gave me this feeling in Tears of the Kingdom. They could have had an exact moment just like that, referencing Skyward Sword. Having a little island with homes that looked familiar to Skyward Sword and maybe just being a callback to that island where lots of the story began. And unfortunately, they didn't do that. And that's just something that I was looking for. Of course, having a Skyward Sword island wasn't going to be what made this game a 100 out of 100 for me. But I personally, I just wanted more to explore more new experiences to have because a lot of my experiences still just was oh I remember this area from Breath of the Wild oh I remember this location and doing this one task from Breath of the Wild hey I remember getting these Koroks from Breath of the Wild and it's just like that same situation repeating in my head every time I found a new settlement or at least a returning settlement in Tears of the Kingdom but I know this is gonna sound crazy but we just started this video I mean we are just talking about the map currently and I want to dive a little bit deeper into this game to the other attributes that made this game a whole. And the next part I want to jump into is the enemy design. And the new slash returning enemies, overworld bosses, and main dungeon bosses that I just want to dive into real quick. So let's jump into that now. About a year or so before Tears of the Kingdom, before we even knew what its name was, I was seeing tons of really cool concept art from artists around the world creating some really unique looking enemies in the Breath of the Wild cell shaded style, and showing us what these enemies could look like if they appeared in Tears of the Kingdom. And when you look at the list of Zelda enemies there are in the past games, you have a pretty giant list of enemies that could make the cut. And it was really exciting seeing these concept arts, and it really hyped me up because I was like, man, some of these designs are awesome and I would really love to see these come in Tears of the Kingdom. So obviously when the game rolled around, I really expected to see at least half of these enemies thrown into Tears of the Kingdom from the past Zelda games. And I feel like only one or two were capitalized on from the long exhausted list. Now as far as new enemies that we got, the list isn't extremely small, but it isn't that impressive either. We got Like Likes, Gibdos, Horriblins, Boss Bacoblins, Froxes, Aracudas, and you could also say Evermeans and Gloom Spawns as well. And we also have the new Constructs, which gives us about seven to nine new enemies. The Like Likes were cool, but they didn't function like Like Likes. There were different elemental versions, which was also pretty cool, but yeah, they didn't just pop out of nowhere and scare you. They were always just there. You could hear them moving and they're very, very slow. And it's the same thing to fight them every time. It's a long sit and wait until they stick out their uvula and then you can attack, making them weak. It's really not hard to defeat them and they were just more annoying than scary or just kind of popping out of nowhere like they used to. The Gibdos were an absolute joke in this game. If anything, they worked more like Redeads and this is literally how slow they would move. I don't think the entire course of this game I got even touched by one of these guys. I genuinely don't even know how they attack. I know there's also Moth Gibdos and they can spit stuff at you which are a little bit better, but yeah I know occasionally they can also get on all fours and crawl towards you really fast, but I've only saw that like once or twice the entire course of the game and I think both of those times were at the very end of the game and somehow the depths the scariest place in the game and meant to be the darkest of horrors of the map literally only had one new enemy and that was the little froxes and of course the big frox which we'll get into in a bit but the little froxes were more like gnats if anything occasionally you'll hear them chirp and they'll run toward you and you could just knock them over by one slice of your sword and then they're done so yeah i don't even understand how that was the only new enemy archetype down in the depths below i will also say the constructs weren't bad at all that new class of enemy was actually very interesting and i found a lot of them to be kind of difficult where you really had to be on your toes because they could hit you from a very long distance and they could move pretty fast on occasion. So yeah, I actually had no problem with the constructs whatsoever. I will also say I did like the horror blends. Even though they didn't pose much of a fight, they did act in a really cool creepy manner as they crawled across their ceiling with their long sticks and they tried to stab you from a long distance. It was pretty creepy and the noise they made was always eerie. And honestly, that list I just showed you is pretty much the general gist of the basic enemies in the game. Of course, like I said, you do have the Gloom Hands, which were a really cool surprise, and it actually was fun to fight, but at the same time, that's really just a once in a while thing that you get to experience. Most of the time, almost every single enemy camp everywhere is just filled with Boss Bacoblins, Bacoblins, Moblins, even Lizalfos. It's the same enemies that we fought for hundreds of hours against in Breath of the Wild, and seeing them again, 
I don't know, it just felt repetitive, especially since there weren't much new enemies to tackle. But let's move on to the stronger, almost boss-like enemies, because surely those are better. Right? Well, eh. I'll tell you right now, the new mini-bosses were actually fun to fight against. They were. Flux Construct was probably one of my favorite bosses in the game, and I loved all the different things that it would do and forms that it would take, and you could do different things yourself with your arm abilities in order to take it out. Whether it's snatching a cube from its body, ascending through a giant platform that it would form, or rewinding time to ride one of its own blocks back up to the main block, which I thought was a lot of fun. The Froxes, on the other hand, were a little easy once you figured out how to take them out. They reminded me of the high Noxes, where all you had to do was shoot their eyes with an arrow and you were good. In fact, if you were standing on their back and taking out the ore deposits in order to defeat it, it would just fling you into the air, allowing you to go straight into bullet time and shoot it in the eye with another arrow, which just stunned it once again. So I feel like I never really had to put up a fight against these guys. And of course, the Gleox. The Gleox were one of the biggest highlights for me in this game. They were so cool. And of course, it was one of those enemies going up to them earlier in the game would just absolutely get you defeated. And as you get ready to chip their health down and get them down to being defeated, they will fly up into the air and unleash some type of giant barrage of attacks based on the type of Gliok that you're fighting, and you would have to make your way up into the sky in order to knock it down. I love this, and I thought this was one of the best type of fights this game had to offer. I am a huge Gliok fan after this, and yeah, I wanted to just keep fighting them over and over again, but that's just the thing, because you will. These are the only new overworld bosses that you will find. That's it, just these three. And after you fight them a couple of times, it gets repetitive. I mean, very repetitive, to the point where you're just tired of fighting flux constructs over and over again. And the skies is filled with these guys and the depths is filled with them as well. And it's just rinse and repeat. I really wish they could have added at least three, four, maybe even five more overworld bosses to fight because three, three, Come on, Nintendo. Yeah, that to me felt a, a little on the weaker side. Especially when considering the fact that all the other overworld bosses are the same ones that come back from Breath of the Wild. You still have your high noxes, which are extremely easy and an extreme pushover by just shooting them in the eye with an arrow, and you can wipe them out very quickly. You still have Moldugas in the sand, which didn't seem like there were that many at all this time compared to the first game. You still have your taluses all over the map, and of course, your Lynels, which are still extremely fun to fight and definitely put up a challenge, but if you played a lot of Breath of the Wild and fought them a lot, you'll probably blow through them very easily as well. And of course you also have the Gloom Hands, which work in a way very similar to Ganondorf at the end of the game. First you take out the hands and it spawns a Phantom Ganon, which actually was pretty cool the first time, but once it kept happening, I just found myself wanting to get away from these things as fast as possible because it just wasn't worth it after I've already fought him a couple of times. It was a really cool first experience, but after that initial scare and terrifying feeling of hands chasing you, it was just like, okay, I've been here, done that, move out of my way. But now the part that I really want to get into, the actual bosses of the game. Because this is, for me, at least one of the best parts of Nintendo games is fighting some really cool bosses, and for Zelda games in the entire series, they normally have some really fun, interesting boss fights. Well, this time, it's not Blight Ganons all over again, it's actually original monsters constructed from Ganondorf's gloom. And we start off, at least with my order, the way I tackle these bosses, with Kolgara. And I wish I never played this one first, because this was the peak of the game for me. Everything about this dungeon, about the lead up to the dungeon, and the boss itself was peak Tears of the Kingdom. I loved this boss fight. Flying through the air and using your arrows in order to break and shatter his glass parts and then fly through them was one of the coolest ideas for a boss fight I've ever seen. And fighting the boss entirely in the air the entire time was amazing. And of course, with all these fights, you'll be using the help of the sages, which are the new current champions alongside you. Where in this fight, Thankfully, you don't have to use tooling that much besides moving out of the way real quick, and it worked really, really well. I love this boss fight, I love the music, it was peak, and unfortunately, with this starting my playthrough, it just completely fell downward from there. Next up, we have Mukto Rock, which is a really cool idea. It's this weird inky Octo Rock that actually can transform his body into a muck version of some other creature, and the entire time, he changes into this giant land shark, which I wish there were different things that he could transform into, like he could go into the air as like a giant ink bird or just different things because the shark, over and over and over again, 
was boring and slow. The whole area is zero gravity, so you're moving very slowly. There's hardly any attacks that you have to dodge, and you have to run over to Sidon in order to use his little special ability to shoot a water wave and knock him out the ink. That's it. Just one little splash of water knocks him out the ink. He runs away, scrambles away. You shoot him with an arrow to stun him. Go hit him. Rinse and repeat. It just didn't do a lot for me, and it just felt so repetitive. And that's a big problem with a lot of these bosses, is normally in Zelda games, when you get halfway through their health, they transform completely, meaning that you have to do something completely different in order to take it down. Not this time. They might hit you with an extra attack or be slightly faster. There's nothing that you really have to change with your strategy in order to take it down once you get halfway through its health, which was a bummer for me. But yeah, Mukto Rock, boring and slow. Then you have Marbled Goma, which is nice to see Goma return, but it's just so stupidly easy. I mean, you literally just take Yonobo and chuck him anywhere in this arena, and almost 90% of the time, he will run into one of the legs. I was just messing around and just chucked him on the back wall behind me just to see where he would go, and almost every single time, I hit something I needed to hit in order to knock down Marble Goma. Then you run into the center of the stage, climb up him, and just wail on his eyeball. It was just like, where is the challenge here? Even when he tried to lock me in a giant circle of rocks, I could just slip through and squeeze through the rocks by running, which was clearly intended for me to use Yonobo. It's just like, yeah, they're focusing way too much on the champion abilities instead of having Link do some unique things in order to take these creatures down, and Link just chucking Yonobo like a bowling ball around this giant circular prison wasn't something that I found fun. I'm not gonna lie, it probably would have been fun if you had to really calculate where you threw Yonobo and you actually had to aim him in specific spots and hit certain slots in between rocks, but no, that, that's not really how it went. It was just like, chuck him anywhere, you're gonna get lucky. And I haven't even gotten into probably everybody's least favorite boss in the entire game, at least from what I've seen online, everyone in the world seemed like they struggled with this one, Queen Gibdo. This one was just annoying, and to me, it wasn't that difficult. It was just stupid. I hated the way this boss was designed, where once again you relied on the champion's abilities, which in this case was Riju, and you pretty much had to walk up to her as she slowly covered the battlefield in electric aura, and then you could fire your arrow at something to electrocute it. Okay, this is all fine and dandy until the fact you had to chase her down the entire time, get her close enough to the Queen Gibdo, and then finally shoot an arrow in order to electrocute it. And you had to do this twice during the second phase, which means if if you mess up one arrow, then you have to rinse and repeat the same stage. And what sucks is after you hit her with the first lightning strike, she backs away and starts chucking things at you. For instance, like sand tornadoes, and you have to actually move all the way out of the way to dodge it, and by the time you move all the way out of the way and reach the other side, she's already regained her health again and you have to hit her with two lightning strikes all over again. It's just a rinse and repeat mess, and it's just sloppy, and it's just once again, take elemental attack and throw it at boss, which is just not a unique gimmick to take down a boss like we've seen in past Zelda games. And personally, I just felt like this was a drag, and I hate it trying to go find the stupid sages that are running around the battlefield in order to walk up to them, click the button, and then chase after a boss. And I'll get into the whole sages situation later on, but still, it really impacted these boss battles in a negative way, in my opinion. I was not a fan of Queen Gibdos, and I also agree with a lot of people, it's just a bad, poorly designed boss battle. What makes it even worse is that for some of the bosses, for instance, like Mukto Rock, you can just throw a water choo-choo at it. And for like Queen Gibdos, you can throw an electric fruit or an electric choo-choo at it, and it will actually stun it, which is just like, so stupid to even think about. It doesn't seem like a good idea for a boss fight. And these are the main four bosses of the game, and there's a problem when, at least what I thought, only one of those to be really, really good. And because of this, it also directly affects the depths and makes them just even worse. Because like I said, you can go down there and there's actually lots of different areas where you can rebattle these boss battles. But the question is, why would you even want to outside of, you know, getting some treasure? And I think a sage's will, if I'm not mistaken. But what's the point outside of that? Like, you're not going to want to go back and fight Queen Gibdos. I think there's a total of two or even three locations for each boss down there. And I could even be wrong. It could be more than that. But yeah, it just kind of tells you that it's just not that interesting of an area of this game. You don't want to go down to an empty, you know, dark area with nothing but the same enemies, the same bosses, and the same stuff you can find above 
above ground. Next up we have the seized construct from the construct factory and I actually thought this one was super unique for a Zelda boss battle. It was a giant mech fight with your mech versus that mech and it was just kind of like blasting each other. You could carry different weapons down in here and attach them your own uh, and you can even use the weapons scattered around the arena and you can just pretty much customize how you want to go about this battle and just completely well on the other ones smacking them against the caged wall. It was definitely a different type of fight that didn't require you to use a sage ability and then just you know walk over there and hold the Y button as you're swinging your sword around to damage the weak point. You're actually doing something that actually matters and it felt really cool to kind of just well on this giant robot with your customizable hand weapons. And phase two actually changed the fight a little bit. It now flew up in the air and you actually had to use a different weapon in order to knock it down and then hit it with your spiked ball on your hand which was just a really cool combo and I enjoyed this fight actually a little too much. I, I wanted more of this and in fact I did kind of get more of this with Master Koga as you fought him four times in four different locations in the devs and I loved how he used the actual mechanic of the game in a boss battle for once. Yes, he actually builds his own vehicles and uses them against Link, and you can jump on them and hijack them or use them against him. And what makes this boss battle so much fun is it's just stupid. You know, you don't have to take it seriously. You can like knock them out of the air. You can build your own vehicle and kind of just mess around with them. And it's just like, I love the creativity and the freedom of a boss battle like this. And each and every single one, I just was playing around and just having a blast. They never were difficult, but well, outside of the flying one, he was, he was beaming me. But yeah, for the most part, not too difficult, but really just a fun, interesting boss battle to have against him. Like it literally looked like we were pirates and I just boarded his ship and started attacking him. Like it's just so good. And I even get another siege construct fight as he has his own construct and it's even a little bit better than the original where you can shoot him out of his construct jump out and start fighting him on the ground as well as both of the robots just sit there and watch and it's actually so much fun it's crazy that master koga was probably my biggest highlight of the entire game or at least one of them for that matter even though i had to fight the same guy four times each time was vastly different from the last and i really enjoyed each battle against him and every time it put a smile to my face it had a little bit of difficulty it had a lot of fun and it was just funny goofy moments that I enjoyed from the game probably one of the biggest highlights of the game for me now I will not be talking about Ganondorf in the end of the game here I will be saving that for the end of this video and yes just overall I really expected there to be more variety in pulling from past games and putting these types of enemies and characters that we've known and loved in this brand new Breath of the Wild style would have been awesome to see return for Tears of the Kingdom for instance the depths could have had tons of creepy enemies like dark nuts and reed deads, actual pose, scotulas, and even big scotulas walking around down there, deku babas, dodongos within the caves, and where's the wall and floor masters? Yes, I know we have the gloom hands, but floor masters just sounded like the perfect addition for the depths. And yeah, I just wanted to see a bigger monster variety. And of course, that goes for the boss battles as well. <laughs> I want to now dive into the gameplay and some of the things that you do within this game. Before I get to the major dungeons, I'm going to talk about the main ones being shrines returning from Breath of the Wild. This time, they are light shrines, and there are 152 light shrines. Now, Breath of the Wild had 120, so clearly they have outdone themselves. Or did they? Well, I'm actually here to say I think I prefer the shrines in Breath of the Wild. Tears of the Kingdom had some really good shrines, do not get me wrong, but they are pretty much categorized in three different things like you would expect. There were puzzles and building, enemy combat, and blessing shrines. So let's dive into the puzzle shrines. These are easily some of the best experiences you will have in this game, which some people enjoyed these, some people didn't, but I found these to be a lot of fun, where you had to build some type of contraption or do some type of weird puzzle by using Link's arm by building things. And I thought a lot of these were really cool. There were some where you had to use a sled to go through the sand, and there were some you had to construct a boat to get across the water, or find some way to build a pendulum to smack a ball into the target, or even build like a tank car in order to cross the spikes or carry balls across a pit. There was a lot of really cool ideas slapped together, but the problem is, there weren't a lot of these shrines. In fact, it felt like there was only like 10 to 15 of these in the entire game that I thought were really cool puzzle shrines. 
That's the main problem. Out of 152 shrines, how is there only about 10 to 15 really fun puzzle shrines? Combat shrines were a lot of fun too. There were some where you had like no gear and you had to go through and get your own gear and defeat all the constructs in the area, which I thought was pretty cool. It was like the Eventide Island thing all over again from Breath of the Wild, and the combat arenas themselves seemed to prove a really unique challenge depending on the room that you're in. Sometimes you had to construct some type of machine in order to take out all the constructs or just, you know, secretly move your way around the maze and take out constructs secretly. These were all great, but once again, it felt like it was the minority of the light shrines, which leads me to my last one, the blessing shrines. I feel like towards the end of the game, where I decided to go and collect all the rest of the shrines I needed, which was probably like 40 or 50 of them, I came across nothing, and I mean nothing but Raru blessings. I mean, it is absolutely insane how many Rahru Blessing Shrines I felt like were in this game, and it felt like the majority, even though it technically wasn't, it was a lot of them. I know a lot of people are going to argue a lot of the Rahru Blessing Shrines are based on the stuff that you do to get to the shrine, but even then I felt like it was the same thing over and over again, especially in the sky, where all you did was grab one of the green crystals and had to make your way to the platform. Once you did, it was a Rahru Blessing. Now some of these crystal missions were actually kind of fun, especially when you had to take the crystal from the sky and bring it down to the ground somewhere in a cave or something like that, and then find a way to get it there was pretty cool, but man, it was so boring just taking one from one sky island to the next sky island by slapping it on a glider and just flying across the sky slowly. But yeah, that's not a shrine to me. That's doing something to get to a shrine. So walking in a shrine and simply getting some type of chest just felt very weak. And I don't know, I didn't like this design. In fact, I went through and I did some math. Breath of the Wild had 120 shrines with 29 blessing shrines, giving it roughly a 24% of the shrines were blessings. Tears of the Kingdom has 152 shrines, and no joke, 48 blessing shrines. Yes, 48 blessing shrines out of a total of 152 shrines, giving us roughly 31% of the shrines are blessings. Maybe I just felt it more because most of the ones that I was missing was towards the end of the game, where like the last 30 or 40 shrines, I felt like 90% of them were blessing shrines, and it was just kind of... Ugh, another blessing shrine. Ooh, here's a shrine. Oh, it, it's another blessing shrine. And it was just like this over and over and over again. And it made me really not like finding these things at a certain point. So to be honest, the shrines kind of let me down in this game because of the lack of good ones. For instance, there were some really good puzzle shrines, and I almost had fun, I think, with every single puzzle shrine in the entire game. Even the ones that some people struggled with and just couldn't figure out, I thought it was a blast messing around with the tools and trying to find my own way. But I just wanted more of those. It felt like Nintendo took once again a lazy route and just filled a lot of them with combats and also just Ravru blessings, taking the crystal to the destination. There should have been more puzzle shrines, especially considering the fact that this game's main emphasis was building. They could have done so much more, and I was just kind of thinking of all the possibilities that they could have done with the building mechanic for these little shrines, which are essentially mini dungeons. And I was still holding out for some hope that Nintendo would add some more shrines via a free update or DLC in the future, but it looks like that's not happening as Nintendo had even confirmed themselves that there would probably be no DLC for this game. So, if anything, the shrines were more of a missed opportunity, missed potential for what they could have done with a really, really good building mechanic in this game. Dungeons are back, or should I say, more proper dungeons are back in Tears of the Kingdom. Where Breath of the Wild had these giant divine beasts, you now have five total dungeons to explore across Hyrule. But I want to break down each one and talk about their strengths and weaknesses. So let's start off with the Wind Temple. The Wind Temple's lead up was one of the greatest things I've experienced in a video game in ages. In fact, I got legit goosebumps diving into the giant whirlwind of the storm to enter the storm win arc. I thought this was one of the greatest moments in the entire game, and seriously, I still think about it from time to time. But how about the actual arc itself? Well, it was actually a pretty well put together dungeon in my opinion. It felt very similar to the sand ship from Skyward Sword, nowhere near as good, but still was really interesting to go through. Using icicles as gears or levers to open and close doors was a really cool idea. 
coupled with great music and of course one of my favorite bosses in the entire game, Kolgara, it was a really good start to the game for me and I thought it did its job as a first dungeon for this game. Now you're pretty much just going throughout these dungeons looking for four or five levers to hit in order to reveal the tier and the final boss for that dungeon, which it's a pretty cool method of going throughout dungeons without actually having that item because of course this is a different method than classic Zelda games, but that's pretty much how all the dungeons are going to work from here on out. And moving on to the water temple, the build up was more of the same of the wind temple, but this time you're just slowly jumping through water bubbles and you also are in zero grav the entire time, making it feel a lot more floaty, but it just felt like more of the wind temple going up to the sky and just not having that big ooh moment of jumping through the thunderhead. But as the water temple goes for itself, it's a very weird dungeon. It's very wide open and you can actually see each of the areas that you need to go from the very beginning, which could be looked at as a cool thing, but also it just wasn't that big on puzzles. I felt like most of the time you could figure out what to do very quickly as everything that you needed was in that one respected area and it didn't tie in other parts of the dungeon, which is what dungeons are known for. And it started to give me this feeling that other dungeons did as well, where it just felt like multiple little shrines slapped together and they called it a dungeon. You'll be spending a lot of time in specific areas and then moving on to the next, and none of them really impact each other as a whole, so the entire dungeon itself, like I said, just feels like tons of segmented shrines. So yeah, instead of different floors or different rooms, you were just in this giant open space in the sky, just going from little pieces of the island to little pieces of the island, solving some quick puzzles. Now these next two dungeons probably gave me the most dungeon feel out of any of the rest and kind of felt like classic Zelda at its core. The fire dungeon had a really cool lead up, fighting some type of giant rock mini boss on top of the volcano with your glider and then diving into the crater of the volcano all the way down into the depths below where the fire dungeon lays. And I thought that was a really cool concept. The fire dungeon itself was also pretty good. I think I was just completely confused at times of how to get to the higher portions. It, this was a very difficult dungeon. This definitely wasn't an easy walkthrough sort of situation situation, you were constantly having to move rails around and take these minecarts in different directions, raising them on different portions and lowering them too, to go higher and lower in the dungeon and hitting specific targets with Yonobo. This was actually a really well put together dungeon, but I just could not figure out how to get to higher portions, so I found myself cheesing it I felt a lot of times by strapping a rocket to my shield and flying up, or simply just climbing the walls of a dungeon, and that's what the climbing portion kind of takes away from some of this exploration, is if you can't get up somewhere, you just climb it. And that was what hurt the fire temple I think the most, is the fact that I couldn't really figure out what they wanted me to do because all I needed to do was just strap a rocket to something and fly upward, or just climb that side wall over there and you'll definitely get to a different section. So I feel like because of that, it kind of lowered the puzzle element of this dungeon a little bit, but still it was a very Zelda feeling dungeon at its core. This is also one of the first times I really started to realize that the map was not great in these dungeons. It was very confusing confusing with all the blues and yellows trying to signify where I was, and a lot of the time I just could not look at the map as clearly as I could some past Zelda games, and especially the Fire Dungeon, it just looked like a mess. And for a lot of people, the Lightning Temple is going to be their favorite, because it has the most classic feeling dungeon out of all of the dungeons in the game. Although the lead up was honestly one of the worst in the entire game. You and Riju are just traveling around using her terrible power to electrocute Gibdos and take them out around the town until eventually you're just running through a sandstorm in the desert trying to look for towers completely blind. I, I don't understand how they thought this was going to be fun compared to the other lead ups to a dungeon. This was pretty bad. Once you're in the dungeon, it feels like classic Zelda to a T. It has the difficulty, it has the crazy exaggerated puzzles, and man, it really had you thinking. From the electric puzzles to even the light puzzles, there was always something going on within this dungeon. And man, it really felt like something straight out of Ocarina of Time, or even Majora's Mask, or even Wind Waker, with reflecting light all around the dungeons from the various different corridors and rooms, and trying to get the light beams to go exactly where you want them to. It was absolutely amazing how they slapped all this together, and I don't even know if I did it right, but still, it somehow ended up working for me. This was definitely the second most hardest part for me in the entire game, and I definitely loved it though. It wasn't something that made me sit there frustrated for hours trying to figure out. 
it was the good type of difficulty. And finally, we have the Construct Factory. And the lead up was pretty unique. It had this giant goose chase taking you through the Farron jungle region, trying to find clues of how to get to this mysterious island in the sky before once again, just like the water and the wind temple, taking some islands all the way up until you could finally find the one that you're looking for. And the entire time it's storming, there's lightning striking. It's a pretty cool scene but it is just more scaling different types of floating rocks until you get to your destination. I found it pretty unique that the dungeon was actually in the depths though, so you had to go from the sky, down to the ground, and then down and underneath the ground into the depths, which was a cool like three tier thing that I wish they did with more missions. But once you're in the construct factory, this one had one of the coolest premises in the entire game, but it just wasn't really executed as well as I would have hoped, honestly. Because you're in this central area in the factory, and you have to go to these mini factories all around the outside, which actually are pieces of a construct that you're building. The arms, the legs, the head, the body, everything is in these factories. And you have to take the containers that these pieces of this construct are built in, and essentially take the container out of the factory so that way you can build the construct in the middle of all the factories where the dungeon is started at which is a really really amazing concept like I said like you're building a robot and you have to actually go around and build it yourself in a really cool way the problem is execution once again trying to get these pieces out of some of these factories are so specific like some of the things that they require you to do is a very very specific build in a game where you can pretty much do anything so yeah what they're looking for you to do is sometimes not what you're thinking for once i wish just like the shrines they actually gave us the freedom to do multiple different things in order to get things across i feel like sometimes i did but there was a couple and i think one instance in the entirety of the game where I actually had to stop and look up how to do it because it was so complicated to move one of the pieces out of the factory. I like how you can actually drive them out of the factory though. You can like slap a steering wheel on it and drive the piece out or you can fly it out or just drag it out if you want and there was different ways that you could do this and like I said on paper this is seriously one of the most unique things in this entire game but also one of the most frustrating, just the way it was executed. Then of course, being able to then use that mech once you've constructed it was pretty awesome, as you had to pretty much take it to the boss arena, which was a long road full of bad guys. And I just think that whole thing put together was really cool. I just wish it wasn't so cryptic. And I see a lot of people giving this dungeon lots of hate online, but I actually found it to be one of my favorites still, just because of how unique it was. So honestly, overall, the dungeons weren't terrible. I still miss the days of the giant themed dungeons with multiple floors and rooms and mini bosses and even a secret item that you have to find in order to complete the rest of the dungeon but still for this being a different take at dungeons it definitely was something that i still enjoyed a part of this game In Tears of the Kingdom, Link swaps the Sheikah Slate out for a Raru Zonai Dragon Arm, and it actually gives him some new abilities and some that are kind of repurposed from that Sheikah Slate. Now, still, I'm not going to dive really deep into the building mechanic yet, as that is for the next section, but let's go through some of his abilities and kind of talk about them. Ultra Hand now allows Link to pretty much pick up anything, and it's just like Magnesis, but this time it's anything, not just metal objects. He can pick up anything that he wants, move it around, tilt it on all these different axes and really just kind of move it in any way that you want which is a lot of freedom in order to set things down the exact way that you need and I really didn't find this to be that hard to use either. After using it a couple times I figured it out pretty quickly and didn't have any problems with it. And the same thing can be paired with Fuse which actually allows you to pick something up and then attach it to another kind of combining two different things. Now this didn't just come in handy when it came to building things but it also came in handy when it came to making your weapons in this game. You could fuse two swords to make an ultra sword or just different things at the end of your sword to have a different effect and you could do the same thing with your shield and the same thing with your arrows which could give them different purposes. Now unfortunately I wish they went a bit further with this. I feel like a lot of the things that you could fuse just didn't do anything. There was like three different things that you could put on your arrows that had unique properties but everything else was just elemental effects and that's really about it with like the exception of a couple things for instance one of the puff mushrooms that actually just caused a cloud to appear over the area and confuse the enemy yeah i wish there were more crazy things that i could attach to my arrow for crazy outcomes and yeah i feel like a lot of the time it was just like oh now you made apple arrow N nothing's different it just shoots an apple oh, oh now you made banana arrow or leaf arrow and it's just like all these different things that you can attach to an arrow 
not too many of them did anything unique. Most of the time, if you attach something to your arrow that didn't have a unique property, all it did was just barely increase its damage by like one. You have recall in this game, which allows you to rewind time, which only really had usefulness in shrines or dungeons where there is specific gears or mechanical pieces where you actually had to rewind them based on the current way that they were moving, or if you wanted to ride a rock all the way up into the sky. But this definitely felt extremely situational based, and I really wished I could have used it on more enemies or even boss battles where the only boss slash enemy in the game that I felt it be extremely useful with was the flux construct, which it almost like wanted you to use this ability to fight that boss. And then you have Ascend, which I thought was going to be a big waste of time in this game, but I can't tell you how much time it actually ended up saving. With all the caves in this game, instead of running all the way back out of cave, where some of them could have took like three to five minutes each, when there's hundreds of caves on the map, it was really cool to be able to just say, oh, I'm done, and just jump out of the cave and end up somewhere above ground. This was actually extremely useful for this game and probably one of the most useful abilities, believe it or not, outside of the building mechanics. Finally, you have auto build, which in my opinion kind of broke the game because once you found a really cool device, you can just build it and sometimes it wasn't even that many materials. Yes, you guys all know about the hover bike that's pretty much taken over the internet by storm when the game released and it just made the game extremely easy and to the point where you didn't really need to build anything else and all you need to do is just auto build you a hover bike and take off, especially considering the fact that it was only three pieces to build, two fans and a steering wheel, and you could find those pretty much anywhere, so a lot of the time you weren't even wasting materials. And this is the only time I found myself using auto build at all, which I will dive more into that hover bike thing when we get into the building section. Like I stated, these abilities felt just more like a glorified Sheikah Slate, a slightly better one at that. I still found myself wishing that in this great open world of Hyrule, I had dedicated items I could use that I would gather from the different dungeons of the world. These are cool additions, but still just didn't quite feel the same as throwing a boomerang at something in order to unlock a door, or blowing up a hole in the wall thanks to bombs, which aren't even in this game technically compared to the Sheikah Slate bombs. There are bombs that you can use with building pieces, but it just didn't feel the same. Now this is probably the section you guys were waiting for. The section that actually makes Tears of the Kingdom what Tears of the Kingdom is, the building mechanics. Now before I even dive into any of my gripes with this, let me be completely honest with you. This is what makes Tears of the Kingdom stand out. This is one of the greatest mechanics I have ever seen or played around with in a video game till this day. This game gives you 27 different Zonai devices to build some amazing contraptions with and gives you pretty much unlimited freedom. You have fans and rockets to propel you forward or up in the air, wheels and steering sticks to drive you around and control your vehicle, batteries to keep your creations running for longer, weapons like cannons and emitters to battle with, even stabilizers to balance creations, and you can even give them heads to give your creation life and sentience to follow and attack after enemies. They really gave us too many great options and amazing tool set to work with. I want to also add how amazing the building process works, because out of my over 300 hours of playing this game, not one time did I experience a bug or any type of lag or just weird situation where my creation just didn't work. If it didn't work, it's just because I didn't build it right, and there was always a correct way to build something. And this mechanic is just golden. I mean, what you're watching right now is little series that I've made, just kind of showing off people's creations across the internet, and I'm sure you've seen some of them, but people are creating giant robots, Star Wars TIE Fighters, or even pickup trucks, and there's just so many crazy things. I think one person was even able to create a working computer in this game with these tools. It's actually mind-blowing what the Zelda team was actually able to do with this building mechanic, and my hat's off and I salute the team because this is amazing, but this is also where my problem comes in. This mechanic is golden. But the problem is, why is it in Zelda? I kept finding myself asking this question over and over and over again, because if you are a hardcore Zelda fan and just want to go to dungeons, defeat enemies and bosses, collect items, and make your way to the end of the game, a lot of the time this stuff isn't going to really resonate with you, because you don't have to do any of it. 90% of the things that you can build and do in this game is not needed whatsoever. You can play this game entirely without it, which 
playing Tears of the Kingdom without building kind of just doesn't make it Tears of the Kingdom. And that is exactly my problem, is that you're kind of forced to build things that you may not want to build. If you love building, I can completely understand why you love this game, but if you just love casual Zelda gameplay, this could be a turnoff for you. I would often stop and ask myself, why am I doing this? Do I need to build anything? I simply need to get from point A to point B. Now I could just strap a rocket to my shield, fly up in the air, and then glide the rest of my way to my destination. Or I could just build that beloved hover bike that everybody's building online that's just two fans and a steering stick, where it's not many materials at all and it's the only thing I need to build. And I'll tell you right now, that is literally the only thing that I would build every single time I had to take a Korok somewhere or just fly to a new destination. It was quick, it was easy, and it was cheap with materials. Hardly no dungeons in the game or shrines or even side quests really require you to build anything outside of simple gliders or basic cars to transport goods. There's no boss in a game outside of Moragia that really requires you to build anything. So I would have loved to see if this building mechanic was better implemented within this game for the enemies or even for the bosses, but that's the main problem. It's just like, why is this amazing mechanic in something like Zelda? If this mechanic was literally in any other game, I feel like it'd be awesome. Something like a game builder garage game where you just have all of these tools and you can just play around in a giant open sandbox and just build whatever you want and do whatever you want would be awesome. So I think this mechanic would be great for a future game that just isn't Zelda. To me, this just did not feel like a Zelda game. It felt like they were trying to push something different within this Zelda landscape where a lot of the time I just did not care about any of it. It was cool to see these creations online and what people were able to create, but I was always asking myself, why do I need to do this? Do I have a reason to do this? Maybe if I was younger and had the thrive to just build things and, you know, play around and be goofy, then maybe, okay, maybe I'd have more fun. But as of right now, I just did not really care about this aspect. I thought it was cool, but something that I just didn't need. And I know I'm kind of diving in a story here, and you can say this even with Breath of the Wild, where you're just running around doing nothing as Zelda is just calling out for help, and you're just not helping her. But it's even more like evident in this game. As you're starting to get some really heavy story beats and learn about what's happening with Zelda and stuff in the past, it really starts to just act kind of goofy when you're just like, oh, I can go save Zelda now, or oh, never mind, I'm just gonna build a robot and, and just walk around with it. Or no, I I'm just gonna build a pickup truck and just go run over enemy camps with it. I don't know. It kind of took away from the seriousness of what Zelda games used to be about. And to me, it just felt like something that shouldn't have even been in Zelda in the first place. And I know this point is gonna be extremely controversial based on what type of player you are, because it really just comes down to if you want to sit down and craft, you're gonna love this. If you don't and you just want to play a Zelda game, you're probably going to hate this. And I've seen both sides kind of argue back and forth and it really comes down to what type of player you are. But this ultimately kind of hurts Zelda. People buy a Zelda game to play Zelda. Like when they purchase a Zelda game, they want to play through dungeons, they want to collect items, they want to fight enemies and go through a story. They don't want to build a robot. You know what I mean? And that is where I started to get a disconnect with this game. Just to be a little bit clearer, because I know some people are still not going to understand where I'm coming from here, the building mechanic is a 10 out of 10 perfection the way it was made. Nintendo obviously took their time, even pushed back and delayed the game multiple times to make sure that this mechanic was running perfectly smoothly. And that's awesome, I just felt like this mechanic didn't fit and mesh well with the Zelda game. At first, I didn't want to make this a whole section, because I wanted to just include this in Link's gameplay, but I'm not going to talk about the gameplay that much in this game. I mean, overall, it's still the exact same as Breath of the Wild. You still have your slow-mo dodges and bullet time with the arrows, so, like, there's not much of a difference. You just now have the ability to fuse new weapons together, and the combat is still more or less the same. I'm not a huge fan of the combat from Breath of the Wild, and that was really one of my only complaints, and it just still kind of transfers here. But another big part of Link's moveset comes through on the Sage abilities, where just like the champion abilities from the first game, they now come back, but this time with the new champions, which are now the Sages for Tears of the Kingdom. And their abilities are more or less exhausting, and it's more the mechanic of how they work, 
not as much what they do. That is, at least for some of them. The sages were really just frustrating to have out in the first place. Once you get all the sages, and if you want to use all their abilities, you actually have to have them active, which means they are on the battlefield with you. And it's not the sages, which even feels less important. It's more like the spirit or soul purpose of the sages. It's like this blue, lifeless character that follows you around looking like one of the sages. And they can get in your way, they can accidentally bump into you where you'll trigger the one that you don't need, because in order to trigger their abilities, you have to run up to one, press the A button once just to get it revved up and ready to go, and then press it again in order to use that ability. And that's the problem. You have to chase down these characters just to use their abilities. If you need to hurry up and use Yonobo's ability to break through a boulder in front of you, you have to run through all the other characters in order to find him, and sometimes they're nowhere near you, you have to run all the way out of your way just to grab him and bring him back to that spot, it would just work so much better if it was like a dedicated button for these, like a little scroll wheel that would pop up just like pretty much for every other thing in the game, just like Link's arm abilities, where you could just pick which one you want to use. And there's some abilities that just make this so much more tedious than it needs to be. Let's go through them real quick. Tulin was easily one of the best new abilities. Just like Rivali, he does the same thing, but in the opposite direction. So instead of shooting you up in the air, he actually shoots you sideways in a horizontal direction when you're flying, which actually comes in handy a lot if you need that extra push into a certain direction. And all you have to do is just tap A while you're mid-air. You don't have to chase him down or anything like that unless you need air on the ground for a couple of like extremely small puzzles. But yes, Tulin was easily the best one, and it was fun to use, easy to use, and and definitely something that you want it to use. Riju is absolutely terrible, and I actually hated this one, because you have to run up to Riju in order to have a ring of lightning appear, and it slowly covers the battlefield. So if you need to shoot an enemy that's far off with a lightning arrow, you have to wait for that lightning or a circle to reach that area, and it's just felt weird and there were a lot of cases where I was like I need to use Riju. Most of the time I just automatically turn her ability off because it just didn't really need to be used unless it was for a specific enemy that had to be struck by lightning or that stupid boss that we already know about. Sidon is pretty much the same way where you have to chase him down, tap A in order to get this water shield which is cool. I guess it technically allows you to take one hit of damage and you also get a water projectile but also once again it's very elemental based, so you really only need to use this on enemies that take more damage with water, which let me tell you right now, is not a lot of enemies at all. It's not anything super special. Yonobo lets you actually fire him off like a flaming bowling ball, which is actually fun to use, and it can actually be accompanied onto your builds, such as your hover bikes or whatever you build to fly around in this game, and you can use him as like a primary weapon, which is pretty cool. Now, the problem with him, once again, is just finding him. I feel like out of all of them, he's the one that runs off the most because once you fire him into one direction, sometimes he'll unroll and then he has to run all the way back to you from his far off destination, which can just be annoying. So it's a lot of chasing Yonobo, which makes this bad. And Minoru gives you a giant mech to pilot, but honestly, as it is fun to use at times, it's just not really practical. I feel like a lot of the time I want to build my own contraption. As you just saw, there are so many better things that you can build outside of this robot. And especially late game, I found myself taking more damage just being in the robot compared to just running barefoot in this game. Because Construct is such a huge target. Unless you're slamming the shield button down and facing in the direction of every single one of the enemies that are shooting at you, you're going to take tons of damage from the enemies all around you as they're running into your legs or your arms or your back, which is pretty annoying. So Overall, the sages in this game felt very bland. They felt gimmicky, and they felt like they were specifically used for the dungeons as this game's quote-unquote brand new items, which I just did not like, and it really, really made me miss my items from past Zelda games. The sages is not a replacement, and neither are the arm abilities, and overall, this game is still missing its classic Zelda identity that I feel like it needs. It's great that this game is going for a new direction with open world and a bigger and grander scope, but it still needs to have those Zelda roots, and that's still been the main problem with this game. And I guess you can boil that down to a lost identity with the Breath of the Wild era right now. It just feels like it's trying to do something a little too new and forgetting some of the things that made Zelda great in the first place.
The last segment that I want to cover today is the story and the ending of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This story was slightly different than that of Breath of the Wild, but still took the same approach. We weren't getting ongoing cutscenes that were progressing the story for Link. Instead, we were getting flashback-like scenes one piece at a time to build an overall story of what Zelda was going through technically in the past after she had been traveled there. The story starts off pretty simple, with Zelda and Link finding gloom rising from underneath the castle, which is a new type of malice spreading across the land quickly, and they find that that it's coming from Ganondorf, and we learn that Ganondorf is actually the one that's been stirring up all this trouble in the first place, and the sole provider of Ganon from Breath of the Wild, and he's been beneath Hyrule's castle imprisoned all these years. We see Link take extreme arm damage and actually shatter the Master Sword, for Zelda falls deep into a pit before she disappears completely. As Link jumps in to grab her, a mystical arm actually grabs him and saves him from his certain doom. Link is actually saved by the spirit of Raru in the future, or essentially current timeline. Raru is technically the very first king of Hyrule, where Zelda actually goes back in time to learn this from the past Sonya in Raru, which is the king and queen of Hyrule. Also back in time, Zelda is able to meet Minoru, which is another Zonai very similar to Raru, who is able to actually create technology and use Zonai devices in order to create contraptions. What's really thanks to her is why we're able to build until our heart's content. Zelda learns about the Zonai, which are an ancient race that come from the heavens, and that she's actually a descendant of Sonya and Raru, the kings and queens of the first Hyrule. During this period, it seems that the curse of Ganon was already been in place. Obviously, from the effects of Skyward Sword, we know that this curse has already been implemented before the Kingdom of Hyrule was even established, which means, yes, we see Ganondorf here and his army of Gerudo as he charges a attack on the Hylians, until we see Raru and Sonya use their magic tears, or as I should call them, secret stones, in order to amplify their power and stop the Moldua attack. For being a descendant, Zelda has a little bit of both of their powers as she's able to actually help stop the attack as well. Ganondorf sees this and knows that he needs his own secret stone, because it can amplify his power further and make him even stronger. So he sets up an attack by pledging his fake allegiance to King Raru in Hyrule. And I don't know why, but it seems like no one else in this entire room feels like Ganondorf is the bad guy. I mean, literally, Zelda knows his name before even coming here, and she even speaks. I believe that man's heart holds many dark ambitions. Just his name, even that, it gives me pause. It gives you a pause because you just fought Ganon. Just add the dwarf. It was so bad, I really thought I was missing tears to find this part of the story, because in order to get these story beats, you once again have to go throughout the world of Hyrule and find tears, and they could be in any order, which kind of sucks, because you can get some scenes further in the story, and you're like, what the heck is going on? And then later get some scenes in the beginning of the story. So I wish there was more of an order to getting these story segments, because you can kind of spoil yourself for what's going to happen. But either way, I always thought I was missing something. Like, clearly, I'm not in the right order right now, because they have to know, right? Eventually, they have to know that this guy is bad before he attacks, right? They gotta be prepared or something. No, they're like completely thrown off guard. Raru said he'll keep an eye on him, still has actually no clue that Ganondorf is evil, let alone the Demon King himself. And he's just completely thrown off guard when Raru gets sucker punched in the back and killed because of this. It's like, it's literally your fault. It's also literally Zelda's fault for literally not preparing them for this. She should know that this is the evil. Why does she not know? How does she not know? Why? Zelda could have prevented all of this. Obviously, Ganondorf then takes Sonya's secret stone and turns into the ultimate power of himself, really just increasing his evil and his gloom and also causing mayhem over the entirety of Hyrule, a bigger blood moon and more of his creatures roaming the land. So Raru stops in his tracks and comes up with an idea to stop the king for good by raising an army of his own 
from different champions from around the regions. He gifts each of them a secret stone to further amplify their power. So this is technically the first group of champions, and it's really cool to see them. Unfortunately, their faces are covered with masks for the Divine Bees. Why are their faces covered the entire time? Every cutscene you see them in, every single time you get a secret stone as Link, you see these sages pop up and they just ramble through the same exact things over and over again. And you just can't see their faces and it really just makes them feel lifeless when they have these masks on. I don't know, I really wish they would have took them off when you rescued each one from their secret stone from their respected dungeon. But nope, they keep their mask on the entire time and it really just kind of lowers their character to me. In the great battle takes place and we know this battle as the imprisoning war where all of the champions are trying their hardest to stop Ganondorf in his tracks even Zelda and they ultimately fail Ganondorf is pretty strong here but Raru has one more plan up his sleeve where he's able to distract Ganondorf thanks to the champions and then hit him with an imprisoning spell which then imprisons him and Ganondorf into stone for a very very long time Zelda able to experience it this time around, she knows that it's not enough to stop Ganondorf in the future, because eventually the spell will wear off, and Ganondorf will come back to power. So she has to figure out something else to do in order to stop Ganondorf in the future and help Link. And one day she heads out to the pedestal and finds that the Master Sword is sent back through time, which is one of the very first things you'll do in this game, because remember, Link had actually broken the Master Sword thanks to the gloom in the beginning of the game against Ganondorf. So Link actually sends his sword back through time, which then is able to be retrieved by Zelda. Zelda knows her purpose. The only thing that will defeat Ganondorf is the Master Sword. A piece of it was able to actually scratch and bubble up his skin, so she knows this is the only thing that can stop him in the future. So she'll do everything that she can to revitalize the Master Sword, which is doing something very insane. She learns from Minoru that you can actually eat and swallow a secret stone. But if you do so, you will turn into an eternal dragon and fly in the air aimlessly for the rest of your lives, losing oneself in the process, which is pretty deep. And the fact that Zelda does all of this just to save Hyrule and Link in the future that she knows is kind of crazy. She turns herself into the light dragon that you see from the very beginning and throughout the entire course of the game, which is just it hits different, I'm not gonna lie. This part of the story was something that I was definitely looking for. A big payoff, a big scene that changed everything, and it was pretty insane. I do believe the story here was a lot better than Breath of the Wild. It actually had story elements that made you care, where a lot of the time in Breath of the Wild it was just flashbacks of stuff that already happened. This still kind of tied into the events of the current game, even though they weren't modern cutscenes, it was technically flashbacks of what Zelda was doing in the past, it still led up to a connection point where Link needed to work with Zelda as she was working in the past and he was working in the future, because later he would meet up with the Light Dragon, hashtag Zelda, and actually gain the Master Sword once again. This was a great full circle story that I actually found to be very interesting. And really, my only complaint is the lack of tie-in with other Zelda games. I hated that Nintendo actually plays as if they forget what happened in other Zelda games. They'll bring up small references or have small Easter eggs that actually confirms that yes, these other Zelda games are still a major part of the timeline, but then just act like they forget them when it comes to the main story. There was no way there was no talk about Skyward Sword or, you know, the events leading up to the first first Hyrule because we know that all of this stuff was because of what happened in Skyward Sword, yet there is no mention of any type of Zonai or any type of creatures like that in Skyward Sword, there was no callback to Skyward Sword, none of that, which I still feel was a bit messy and sloppy and just does not fit into the timeline neatly. Even as hard as you try to place it, it just doesn't quite make sense and there are story loopholes. With the Master Sword in hand, that takes us to the end of the game. How well does Tears of the Kingdom end its story and its gameplay? Well, let's talk about it. In order to fight Ganondorf, you have to dive into the giant chasm that is now beneath the floating Hyrule Castle. And this is a perfect way to have the end of the game's location placed, because of course, with the newly added depths, where else would you want to finish the game at? Right underneath the castle itself, where the story all began. And you get to actually go through the caves and the networks where you actually started the game. I like how this whole game's feeling is a full circle. Now, obviously with the logo and with all 
saw the trailers from the beginning, we kept seeing that Ouroboros sign, which is the giant two-headed dragon circle, which is pretty much like a loop. And that's what this whole story felt like. It was one giant loop, where where we started was where we ended, and also the story all circled around together. It all kind of warped together from Zelda's past interactions to Link's future present time interactions, and I really like how they kind of played off of that idea of everything loops back to its origin. But you're pretty much traversing a giant series of caves, and as you get deeper and deeper and closer and closer to Ganondorf, you'll see malice increase, you'll see more enemies increase, and it just gets creepier and darker, and I love this feeling. This is what the entirety of the depths should have felt like, and I loved how it had this creepy, eerie end of the game feel, where it was an amazing lead up to the final boss. Depths were already super deep below the ground, but I just kept felt like I was going even lower and lower and to a point where I thought there's no way there's any more room for this game to go deeper and it still did and I absolutely love that it really feels like Ganondorf was down in the pits of hell almost but then you'll move into a section where you have a gauntlet of enemies to take out and uh, for some reason the champions are there or should I say the new sages why i don't know the fact that they didn't follow us the entire time was weird and now they just randomly show up after we drop down super deep into this cave well it doesn't matter they're here to help and yeah you're just going through armies of past enemies but they're now gloomified which actually makes this pretty interesting because you have to be very very careful here once you get hit by one of these gloom attacks you actually lose that heart for good and there's no way to replenish your lost hearts before you fight ganondorf which means the battle can be either easier or harder Harder depending on how well you do in this first phase against his army which is pretty interesting and does raise the difficulty up a bit and then all of the game's bosses reappear and this is where I was actually getting super excited I'm like is there gonna be a new way where we had to fight all these bosses again but maybe as the champions oh could you imagine if you could play short segments with the champions and just take out these bosses and like actually see their side of the story that would have been awesome but nope it, it's just the cutscene where they go off to fight them and link moves on to the battle room to fight Ganondorf. I really would have loved that little touch of us playing as each of the champions real quick to fight the bosses one last time, just as an easier way, maybe not as long as the original bosses, but man, yeah, that, that would have just been awesome. Not super upset about that, but just something that I felt would have been really cool to see, or at least see the scene of all of them fighting together would have been cool. But Link runs off into the final room in order to defeat Ganondorf once and for all. This fight starts off pretty simple and familiar to a fight that we had earlier in the game with Phantom Ganon, and in fact, you can fight him multiple times thanks to the Gloom Hands, where Phantom Ganon will always appear. But it's pretty much the same fight, but now with an actual Ganondorf. But they move and act essentially the exact same so it's almost like Ganondorf was preparing us from the very beginning on how to fight him which is still a, a little strange but yeah it's essentially the same fight again and of course he will shift through his different weapons but all of his attacks are very slow and very telegraphed it's extremely easy to parry or even just quick dodge out of the way from every single one and he also has some gloom attacks that he can also shoot, which makes you lose hearts, which can end up making the battle a lot harder if you get caught in the gloom for too long. Ganondorf then obviously powers up thanks to the secret stone, and watching his health bar actually cross the entirety of the top of the screen was a pretty sick moment. It was like, dang, he's not playing. The health bar just did not stop. It kept growing, and it really made him feel like a monster. Every time I looked at him, I couldn't help but think of how much resemblance he had to demise the original source of evil from the legend of zelda's skyward sword i was a really big fan of his design in this game but with that said even powered up his attacks stayed primarily the same they were a little stronger maybe a little faster and now he can do a quick time dodge the same way as link and do the flurry rush so it's really both of you dodging each other back and forth which i thought was a really cool concept but overall it was just meaning that you had to dodge twice now and instead of once it's cool that your friends also come into the room to help after they defeated their own bosses in the other room but then ganondorf says nah get away and like slams them against the wall where he makes it once again a 1v1 it's a really good 1v1 fight 
but of course, thanks to Tears of the Kingdom and you could even say Breath of the Wild's mechanics, it just makes this fight very cheesable. You can simply just fly up into the air and then rain down on him with powerful arrows. I mean, if I wanted to keep doing this, I could probably have defeated his entire health bar in like three of these and then been done, which is not great. And I had to actually stop myself and said, nope, let me drop back to the ground and actually fight him because I, I don't want to end the game like this. this. This is too easy. And that should never be the case, especially with some of the more powerful attachments that you could fuse arrows with in this game, like bomb arrows or even the Gibdos bone arrows. You can deplete his health bar extremely quickly if you wanted to. And that to me just made me feel like I had to, you know, make the battle easier myself because I'm going to kill him too fast. That made me feel too powerful and I didn't really want to feel that way in this game. Like I said, it felt kind of strange that there was no implementation of the building in this final boss battle, which made me believe that the building was just like this funny after sight thing that you could do in the game and didn't really have any type of meaning to the overall story. And that's why I said earlier, it kind of takes the seriousness away from what makes the story so good in the first place. Like why was there even building in this game? Ganondorf doesn't use it and you don't even need it for the end of the game. Like there was no use for and it didn't appear at all. The main mechanic and gimmick of this game is not used in the biggest scene of this game. But at the end, Ganondorf gets mad, rips off his secret stone, and actually eats it to turn himself into a dragon as well, which you probably saw this coming, but still, it was pretty awesome to see happening. You then team up with the light dragon, obviously being Zelda, to take out the dark dragon, which is Ganondorf, or in this case, called the demon dragon. Now, I may not have been a huge fan of the final Ganondorf battle, but this scene right here is what makes final bosses so special. They don't necessarily have to be the most difficult thing in the world, and neither is this battle against a demon dragon, but the cinematicness, is that a word, of this battle is just crazy. It is so beautiful. There is a sunset coming over Hyrule, and you're in the air high above the clouds fighting a giant demon dragon with the help of Zelda, a giant light dragon. And you have to land on his body and take out all of these malice points or gloom points. And it's just so cinematic in the music and everything. It feels so surreal. I absolutely loved this ending to this game. Finally, Link is able to go in for his final attack to end the game. The skies turn a dark gloomy red and you fly up into the air with a giant blood moon in the background and you go in for the final strike. Zelda sets you up in position and you dive down for your final attack. Even a year later, watching this back is giving me legit goosebumps. I might not have had as grand of a time as a lot of people did with Tears of the Kingdom and still found a lot of problems with this game, but there's one thing that this game did not mess up on, and it's its ending. It was as cinematic and as beautiful as ever, and seriously one of my favorite endings now to any Zelda game of all time. Literally the entire section of the last hour or two of this game was some of the best moments in the entire series. And I felt like the ending, getting into the Hyrule Castle area and actually diving into the depths and finding Ganondorf, taking out his army, defeating Ganondorf in his multiple different phases, and then taking out his dragon form is just a chef's kiss of an ending. For once, this ending has a special feeling that feels like finally, after all of these years that these people have endured against Ganondorf and Ganon, it's finally over. The war against the evil is finally done. Ganon and Ganondorf are completely sealed. There is finally no more problems. Of course, Zelda is free from her dragon imprisonment, but they still give you another cinematic part to this game diving down beneath the clouds to rescue and grab Zelda from her impending fall is one of the most cinematic looking moments and feeling moments in the entire game.
just a beautiful ending, even though somehow they survived this. Link and Zelda finally look back at Hyrule, finally cleansed of any type of ancient evil, and it's just a good feeling, even though that the post credit scene made me actually wonder if there was something more to this two game series that we've already had. Because it didn't quite feel like a nice and neat ending to me, it felt like they were almost leading up to something to come, cause Zelda is talking about how now her new mission is to prevent this ancient evil from returning over and over again, how she actually wants to end the Demon King's curse, which is pretty interesting, and it's something that I've talked about for a while now. What if there was a Zelda game that actually found a way to stop this curse from happening? The continuation of a new Demon King every century or so, it felt like maybe there was something that they were either teasing with a future game, maybe a third game in this series, or maybe just a new Zelda game altogether that kind of works with the Demon's Curse. Maybe a way to end the curse. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but that definitely felt a little eerie at the end. Tears of the Kingdom was not the sequel that I expected or thought that we would get. I thought they would double down on the amount of dungeons and how the dungeons worked, and maybe give us more of classic gameplay feel to the new style of the open-endedness of Breath of the Wild. I was expecting maybe even a new world to explore, and new areas to find, and unfortunately I didn't really receive that. The depths were very lackluster to me, the overworld changes were just not quite enough to make me super excited, and the Skylands were a very minor part of the game as a whole. I was really wanting that experience that I originally had with Breath of the Wild all over again. A new world to explore, new surroundings to look at, new enemies and creatures and NPCs and towns to find, but unfortunately I found myself diving right back into a game that I already loved but already seen way too much, especially after 100%ing Breath of the Wild all the way to full completion. The little changes that they added to the already beloved world was just not enough to give me that repeat experience from the first game. Unfortunately, Tears of the Kingdom did not hit the highs that I wanted, but still had some really great moments, with an amazing building mechanic that should be implemented within a future game, maybe not Zelda related, but definitely should not be thrown away because there is a lot of potential there, and also the fact that there was a pretty good story here, with an amazing, absolutely perfect ending, even though this game wasn't what I was expecting, it still gave me moments to smile about, and reasons to remind me why I love Zelda in the first place. But even through the great moments of both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, I can say I am tired of this world. I'm tired of the world, the story, and the characters and really just want to move on. After Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, and Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, it just feels like for the last 10 years we've been stuck into this world even though it hasn't been that long yet. And I just, I, I think I'm ready to move on to the next story, the next art style, the next Link in Zelda, and the next evil. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to me rant about this game and it's something that I wanted to do for a very long time now. I am very curious to hear if you guys agree with me or disagree with me. But before we go, let's take one more dive to end the video.